Oh, I'm just fucking cheating out, and Richard's like, I don't fucking know. It's the last one. Well, he didn't swear, but. I just fed up to him. I was like, what do I want, Richard? Just put it in that one. We'll get a bit of all in one go. Look how big and green this is. Look how big and green this is. It's big and green. It's big and green. It's big and green. Like me. Yeah, that's better than my one. What is God's it? Penis God's penis? God's penis? Hogs? Yes. If a hog had a penis, I'm trying to be like that, not like that. I'm trying to be like that. You said it was long and green, that's actually quite good. Look at Harley. Smooth. I did well with that. And that was recorded. It's in the TV frame. It's going to be a live stream. Bro, what sound would you watch? It's a huge screen. Uh, no, it's just like a fancy dancing pattern on it. That is strong. That is very strong. What is it? A coffee frappuccino. I thought I'd get cream and stuff, but I didn't. Do you want? You should ask for cream. I thought they'd ask me. Oh, dear. I can't eat this. I want to see that. I'm enjoying it very much. Good. I'm glad to enjoy your short shape. <laughs> okay, I think I have to use this. Uh, <laughs> I think it's to do with the projectors, not the computer. It's interesting how I would give all these weird features. Seriously, what on earth is going on? I don't know, but I'm not really complaining. I am. I want to see what I'm learning. I'm about in a while. Have you tried to eat it? This is very difficult. Okay, now I'll speak my... Oh, so now I'll speak my started revision. I think I covered metal. I covered various types of metal. I covered steel. And in steel we covered a common steel. <laughs> And then arrow seed. Remember, if ten common seed, you need to know the difference between the low common seed, medium common seed, and high common seed. This is what you need to know about common seed. These are the cheap materials, okay? The low cost type of seed. Then we looked at arrow seeds, which were sort of more exotic seeds, and these were things like stainless steel. They are a lot more expensive than 10 modern states. We need to know why we need to use them sometimes, about how much they are, and some of their properties. Okay? Remember these properties, they are all in the world. First matters, these are the ones that are not based on time. We looked at aluminium alloys. And I said aluminium alloys are classified in two ways. First of all, they are classified according by the way they are produced. We have cast aluminium alloys and raw aluminium alloys. Cast, as the name suggests, are the type of aluminium alloys, the aluminium components that are produced by the process of casting. Raw ones are the ones that are produced i.e. by rolling, extrusion, forging, drawing, and so on. The main difference is that the rolled ones are stronger and tougher than the cast ones. 
They are also classified aluminum acids <coughs> according to whether they can be heat treated or non heat treated. And they are known as heat treatable and non heat treatable. Again, you need to know that. Again, the strong ones are the heat treatable ones. Heat treatable ones. Okay. The heat treatable ones are normally sort of strengthened or made stronger by two processes. Heat treatment of aluminium alloys. There are two processes. The there two, it is a two-stage process. The first stage is known as solution treatment. Right. And this is simply, simply heating it to a temperature of just over 500 degrees. Heat. Or just above, just above five hundred degrees. The second stage of treatment is called age hardening. This is just a name, which is heating. Depending on the alloy, at a temperature between about 90 degrees to about 100 and say 50 degrees, depending on the alloy. And this is the key process. That is make, what makes them hard and strong and strong, hard and strong. Okay, these are the two heat all aluminum alloys, if, if they are heat treatable, undergo that. Remember that. Okay? And these are the ones that give you very strong aluminum alloys. The ones that they use in aircraft structure and so on. You're welcome. You do need to know the density of aluminum, roughly why you use aluminum, because it's light, it's corrosion resistant, yes? And yes. if you do the right heat treatment, it can be strong, right? <coughs> it is a lot ex more expensive than plain carbon steel. Right? It's non-magnetic, depending on the grade. Some of them can be easily shaped. Some of them can be quite strong and tough. All right? Then we talked about copper alloys. I said, there are basically three types, main types of copper alloys. One is, I mean, I said alloy. One is a very low alloy copper, almost pure copper, that they are mainly used as conductors or wires, paper, etc. All right? Very low impurities, almost pure copper, sort of 99.5% of copper. That's mainly for conductors. Then we have two main alloys that are used for products. One are known as brasses, and we need to know that brasses, what are brasses made of? Copper and zinc. Copper and zinc. And then bronzes. Bronzes are mainly copper and tin. Although there are some bronzes, for aluminium bronze, for example, but if there are things other than tin, you can the name such as. For example, if you have an aluminium bronze, it's called actually aluminium bronze. It means it is copper or bronze with aluminium. Okay. All copper alloys are good in corrosion resistance. All copper alloys are quite heavy. They are heavier than steel. Why? Because copper has a high density. Again, special properties of copper, good corrosion resistance, 
good aesthetics. They look nice. They have a lot of application. Very good electrical conductivity and heat conductivity. Right? But copper is not cheap. Copper is expensive. It's more expensive than uh, cones. Let's see. Which one is the. I'm not so sure. Won't say anything. I don't want to happen. Oh, I've got the latest price of copper. All you just have to trust me. Trust me. Aluminium is aluminium, and these are these are not hands. These are dollars. Aluminium, aluminium is something like just under two dollars a kilo. Right. Depending on the type of aluminium. Copper, copper is six <laughs> six point four dollars a kilo. Okay? In the same the same uh, you want comparison, ten carbon sticks, the cheap ones are about four hundred dollars. A ton, but forty cents. <laughs> It's it cheap. <laughs> titanium, titanium is something like now fifteen dollars. I don't expect you to know the exact value, but to have an appreciation of the price of it, of the cost of it. All right. Okay. So, the so copper is not cheap, but it looks nice. It's got a lot of uh, special application. Then after the other, then we have other alloys, like nickel alloys. What's special about nickel? How do you spell that? Exactly. Extremely good in corrosion resistance. Extremely good in corrosion resistance. Uh, what's bad about it? Well, not bad, but it's expensive. It's about 7,000 pounds a ton. <coughs> Seven pounds a kilo. Over thirteen dollars per kilo. That's expensive. Uh, then the other alloys, depending on what they have, they're generally expensive. Special alloys. Right. I don't. I don't expect you. Know, no, it's by not, but you have to have an appreciation of the common, of the main, and also know where to find the others. If you have a problem and you, you need a need to you need to choose the process. Sorry, you need to uh, find out their properties. Okay. Any questions on methods? Have you looked at previous exam papers? I put the exam papers. Are you confident with it? <laughs> Any question? I've got a copy of it. <laughs> so if I ask you, you'll be able to answer <laughs> Okay, well, let's, let's go by that. Because the question will be of this time. Okay, let's talk a little bit about and what this is one of the questions. I want you to explain how these uh, so the processes or have these uh, features affect the properties of or physical properties of plastics, polymers. Degree of polymerization. What does degree of polymerization do? What is degree of polymerization? Polymers. Mm -hmm. oh, well. 
In the fact that is what it is, the length of the degree of polymerization. Strictly speaking, the degree of polymerization, and you need to know that, is the number of individual mares in one single polymer chain. Then, you know, polymers, is, polymers are made up of chains, right? Depending how many mares individual molecules are in one length of chain, in one continuous length of polymer, polymer chain, then it is strong, stiff, or soft, and flexible. The degree of polymerization is the number of polymer, and the number of mesh. The, more, the higher degree of polymerization, i.e., the more mesh, i.e., the longer the chain is, the stiffer and stronger the polymer. Right? Typically, typically, what is the degree of polymerization in a polymer, polymer solid, solid polymer? Is it less than 10, less than 100, less than 1,000, more than 1,000, more, more than a million? So, how many? Uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> no. You need, I mean, there may be, I don't know if there are millions, but there are certainly they need to be over a thousand. It doesn't have to be millions. But perhaps one day they will have polymers that will be very heavy. Okay, so we are talking, look, generally gases, gases are under 10. Liquids of 10 to perhaps hundreds, solids over a thousand. So, degree of polymerization. So, that's important. The second part of the question is amount of cross linking. What is cross linking in polymer? Oh. Come on. Come on. It's logical. It's what the name tells you what it is cross link. Cross link. Linking chain together. I mean, a, a polymer. A polymer is made up of yes, chain. Length of chain. Okay. If you come and link them together somehow, if you come and link them together somehow. We say we have cross link them. Cross link them. What does that mean? What, what, what do you think? What effect will that have on the properties? On yeah, exactly. If, it's all logical. Imagine you have these beads. If you connect them, then it will be more difficult to deform them. If you interconnect the beads. What is cross linking? Sorry, cross linking. Example, the, the most important, the most common example is cross linking of rubber. Rubber is a sort of whitish liquid in its, in its sort of virgin, in its raw form. It comes from tree. I think it's sort of milk is from tree. Right, very fresh. Right. And it's, it's sort of gooey, liquidy, not solid. <coughs> If you heat it with sulfur, with rubber, if you heat it with sulfur, it sulfur cross links it. Okay, S is for sulfur. Okay, and then you get a nice solid rubber. Okay, that's an example, but that is cross link. So cross-linking, the answer to this question, cross-linking, it makes the polymer stiffer, certainly stiffer and stronger. What does crystallinity do to polymers? If you have a crystalline polymer and a non-crystalline polymer. <coughs> 
Remember, you should know the difference between crystalline and amorphous and non crystalline material. Right, good, yes, that is what it does. But the difference between, first of all, you, you must know that because the question could be explained was what is crystalline? What's the difference between crystalline and amorphous material? The answer to that is crystalline material have an ordered structure. The molecule atoms have a particular order, a more discipline, they have, they have, if you like, discipline position, set position, regular position. They are set in specific rows and columns. Okay? When they are ordered, they have some degree of order, we say <coughs> they are crystalline. In plastics, this is what I'm this is what I'm Plastics are mostly amorphous, are in not crystalline. Only some plastics, only some plastics, generally simpler ones, not polyethylene, are ordered. And when they're ordered, it's not like metals that are sort of nicely and regularly ordered. When 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 you say when you say polymer is older, it simply means there is not a bit like like this. If you're older, <coughs> there's some sort of regular regular. We say it's crystalline. We say crystalline. If it's not crystalline, if it's amorphous, amorphous as against crystalline. Amorphous means without shape. <coughs> okay, all over the place. That's amorphous. All right. Now the effect. The effect is that when when, when polymers are crystalline, again they are stiffer, stronger. All right. And they tend to have a more pronounced, a more exact melting point. Amorphous polymers, amorphous materials like this, when you heat them, they gradually get softer, 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 and then they become flimsy. There is no sharp change. Crystalline material, ordered material, whether they are metals or polymers, they have a lot, for example, water. Water, when it gets to a, for example, ice. Ice, ice is a, 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 a water, solid water. Solid water, once it is below zero degree, it is solid. The minute it gets to zero degrees, it starts melting. Regular or crystalline material do the same. They have an exact melting point. It's not a gradual melting. Whereas these, they have a gradual one. You don't know when it's melting. What sort of a, a gradual process? Whereas these have a sharp, sharp melting. The other thing we need to remember, metals are all crystalline. Plastics, at best, at best, something like poly polyethylene, which is the same uh, as a simple picture, at best, it's about 95, 96% crystalline. It's never, never 100% crystalline. Right? More complex, more complex polymers on my question. Sorry. What about if you melt a metal? Metal. Me metal ha metals have an exact, exact melting point. The, if I, well, what happens with metals? <laughs> they sort of they get to an exact temperature. But if, if you're cooling from high temperature, an exact. Yeah, but does its structure change? Sorry? Does its structure change when it's a liquid? Uh, of course, it, because when they are in 
when they are in solid form, atoms are in crystalline. And you remember those BCC bodies, FCC, etc. They have their labs regular shape. When they are liquid, they are all over the place. So they don't have a structure for solid. The, 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 the atoms are sort of floating about. Okay, so the effect of crystallinity, you know. Ah, there's another one. So it was the degree of polymerization I explained, amount of cross linking I explained, and crystallinity I explained. <coughs> Plasticizes. Have you heard of plasticizers? What are plasticizers? It, it is as the name suggests. Additive. Exactly. Additive. They they are generally additives to they add to plastics to make them more pliable, softer. Yeah. Right. Reduce the density. Reduce the softness. Make them easier. <laughs> You've heard of UPVC. Have you heard of well you know what PVC is? Polyvinyl chloride, yes? It's a very common one. It says lots of adverts for UPVC windows. What what do you think UPVC means? As it well not as it happens to UPVC is resistant to, uh, or more resistant to UV. But UPVC means that you need unplasticized PVC. So it has, it hasn't got that plasticizer. Plasticizer, imagine plasticizer adding it to make it thinner. Generally, the effect of plasticizers is to make the plastic more viable but weaker. And also, also, with a lot of plastics like PVC, if you want resistance to UV light, then you don't add plasticizer, you unplasticize UV. But in general, it the plasticizers make the material, as the name suggests, more plastic more uh, pliable, more uh, uh, softer, more workable. Okay. What else do we know? Okay, that's not in the question, but next question may be the question in the exam may be something else. I'll, 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 I'll throw some questions at you. <coughs> Uh, what is what is addition polymerization? What is polymerization? You haven't done your revision yet, have you? No, you haven't. <laughs> polymerization is the process of forming a polymer, forming a solid polymer. Mares coming together, joining each other into molecules, forming a solid. Polymer, solid plastic. That is polymerization. There are two main types of polymerization. Addition polymerization, which is a chain process. Right? One molecule comes, opens one hand, one arm, <coughs> one bond to join the next molecule. Once that happens, that has in effect open and all sort of inviting the next one to come in. And this is a chain reaction. It's, so the, once you start, once you start it, say here, it goes on as a chain reaction. And it goes on until it is terminated. It's a very rapid process, it's a simple process. It's called addition polymerization. Addition polymerization. All simple polymers like polyethylene, uh, polystyrene, ABS, they are that. Initially formed that way. The other process of polymerization, i.e., formation of plastics, well done, condensation polymerization. In condensation polymerization, <laughs> the process is not chain reactions. 
at every step of the way, a, rea a chemical reaction occurs, which causes the, con the quote, production of the byproducts. That's why it's called condensation, i.e. condensation or production of the side products. Very often the side product is or byproduct is water. A uh, common example is nitro. These are all in the notes. Very simply explained. Nylon is polymerized, is formed by condensation polymerization. Every time the process happens, one molecule of water is produced as a byproduct. <coughs> okay. What else about polymers? Anything else that you can do with polymers? The job mentioned. This is in the notebook. Filler. Fillers. Fillers, as the name suggests, are things that you add to polymers. Not pesticides, but pesticides are for a particular purpose which goes softening. Failure generally, generally, are to add bulk hop to polymers to make them bulk. Yeah, um, it's a sort of the, not always, but nearly always, nearly always, as something to make it cheap. The cheap things like pulp, pulp and powder, they add to make it bulk. Yeah, basically, basically. But cheap, I was going to say rubbish, yeah, I have to make it cheap and put it here. But generally, to give it fall. They'll put the fingers. Don't see that. Come across polymers again in the new processing. Let's do a quick revision of the work we covered in meta processing. What did we do in meta processing? I explained about casting last week. Sand casting, die casting, different types of die casting. Right. Now, what about metal forming? What forming methods have we got? For metal. What are the main ones? Come on, you know that. Come on, sense. Is it forging? Forging, yeah. Forging one, yeah. Extrusion, rolling, these are the main ones. Then there are sort of extrusion has got a very similar process, like for example, tube growing. Strictly speaking, it's not called extrusion, but very similar to extrusion. Extrusion, the, the, the main feature of extrusion is that the metal is forced into a die. To take the shape of a die. If the die happens to be tubular, then we choose. Yeah? If it takes out an element, takes out an The important the important feature, the most important feature of extrusion is that you get a constant cross section, which is good and bad. It's good because if, for example, you want to make ladders, if you make if you want to make railing, it's very good. You can get Loads of it very quickly, very fast. But if you want, for example, to have a, <coughs> a shape that has curves in it or sort of special features in it, then it's no good. If you want to make one question, one year was uh, discuss uh, processes suitable to make um, legs for a table, right? For a coffee table. From metals or plastics. Okay, if you're happy with nice straight plain legs, extrusion is fantastic. Good, but exactly the same. But if you want them to be sort of a cabin charge, they call it some calling like that, then extrusion is not good. Yeah. Rolling. What is rolling? Rolling again produces a constant cross-section. Mostly used for to make plates or strips. 
but it can also be used, as we've seen it being used, to make rods, various shapes, circular rods, hexagonal rods, etc. The forging. Rolling and extrusion produce a continuous shape. Forging them. So if you compare these three, if you compare these three, what do they compare? I said, extrusion and rolling produce constant cross sections. Those are limited, right? Forging is not limited. But the disadvantage of forging is it's much slower, therefore a lot more expensive. Because you are doing with the individuals. All these, all, all these processes produce much better strength and toughness. Remember, rolling, forging, extrusion produce much stronger material than plastic. All right, remember that. So it wants strength and especially toughness. Especially toughness. You don't want toughness. If you want high toughness, toughness are not good. At best, you get a moderate toughness. Okay. Now, we talked about uh, sort of various the sound casting. And various types of die one of, one of the features of casting, for example, die casting, is that it sort of uh, produces a net shape. In other words, a shape that is complete. Right? So it's called net shape. Net shape. Okay? It's not like uh, extrusion or rolling. So you get the final shape. <coughs> Can you think of other processes that produce similar to things to cost things? Pressing. Pressing in what way? Yeah, pressing. Yeah, you can press uh, thin uh, strips of metal into shape. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But suppose you want to make something more solid. Any 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 other process, process other than casting to make uh, I don't know, say uh, a tube, a sphere. And we don't want to use casting. Any other process you can think of for metals? Parametallurgy. <laughs> it is when you say pressing, but it is the first the first stage is pressing. The first remember, parametallurgy is, is, is a is a very is a very impressive P O W Oh metallurgy. 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 You know what it means? Does anybody know what it means? Well done. You just said this. It's not your metal. But it is the process, the process is known as the proper name. It's part of the metallurgy. It's or some some people very often they call them simple process. Now, it's a, it's a two stage process, it's a two stage process, but it has certain advantages and disadvantages compared to casting and raw processes. It's, as I say, it's a two stage process. The first stage is pouring 
the powder into a dye and compressing the powder into the shape you want. And you press it so hard that the bits of powder stick together. Right? They stick together so hard that even when you bring them out, they stay together. But still, that's true though. Sort of very tough, very strong. But they stay together. You need to stay together. You can sort of handle them. I brought, I brought some, some examples here. When it is in that, when it is in that state, you call it a green compact. So the first state is producing a compact. We call it a green compact because it's green. It's not cool. It's not. Cool. <coughs> The second stage, the second stage is actually cooking. Not making it, the term is sintering that green compact. You put it in the furnace, heat it to a suitable temperature, normally below, normally below the melting point. And at that temperature, this powder, bits of powder that are kept together by you pressing them. So the join each other molecularly yeah. right forever and you get a solid form just like a casting just like it, any other solid metal what are the advantages the advantages is that okay you produce something like a casting but the dimensional accuracy is much better than what you get in casting you can actually get very good gears, precision gears. You can actually make precision components out of it. So you can get good, good dimensional accuracy. You get better surface finish. You get better toughness, better strength than castings. Not as good as not as good as rolling. Not as good as forging, not as good as exclusion, but better than possible. Okay? But you have to pay. It's more, much more expensive than costing. So what's it good for? It's good for situations where you are making lots and lots of something. You're talking about tens of thousands. If you're making a thousand, Two thousand of something, not. It's, it's not a if you're making tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, it's a good course. It's a false one. They both, both, they, this compaction, the first stage, both stages are very quick. An automatic uh, sort of a machine pours the powder into the dye, into they call it two. Goes further, machine comes and presses it, goes further. Is ejected and goes on a on a belt and transferred into the oven, into the furnace, to the center. So the whole thing is normally very good. You can you can you can produce 40, 50 a minute if you get your production process in time. So it can be quite good. You can use it on steel. A lot of steel is produced. Iron and steel is produced that way. We can do it on aluminium. We can do it on uh, brass, bronze. To be quite honest, I say you can do it on aluminium, and they do it on aluminium. Uh, no, there is almost no method that you can't do it on. Um, I tried it on aluminium and it was hopeless. <laughs> but, but but they do it in the industry. I've, I've, I've done I've done it, uh, iron, steel, copper, aluminium failed miserably because you know, because aluminium had uh, some oxidizes. By oxidizes, I don't mean rust. But it oxidizes. And when oxidizes, that compaction is very difficult. And they don't stay together. To eject them, still perfect. But having said that, I said they do it in industry, but uh, aluminium, but they do it under a sort of controlled atmosphere, so there is no oxidation. The way I've been. Anyway, all 
almost all methods can be done. Almost all methods can be done. As long as we can tell them to have that, which we can. Right, before we move about, uh, we we'll, we'll move from the method shaping, uh, in fact, net shaping, there's another process that we talked about that does net, produces net shapes. So we talked about various types of we talked about sun casting, die casting, pattern metallurgy. Come on, this is another process. Well done, thank you. That's it. Investment casting or the lost wax method. Investment casting is that process yeah, in which first you make the shape you want from wax. Right? Then you coat it with a sort of a ceramic liquid, slurry, let it dry. And once it's dry, it forms a nice rigid shell around your wax model. So you've got this now shell inside of which is wax. If you now fill this shell with a liquid metal like aluminium, like anything, and almost any metal can be then it goes and fills in the gap, the cavity. Obviously, the wax melts away, and once it's solidified, it takes the shape of that, exactly the shape of that wax model you make. All you have to do now is hit it, break that ceramic shell, which is very brittle, very easily uh, shattered, broken away, turn it away. Uh, you've got your casting. There is almost, almost no limitation on the shape you can make. You can make all sorts of fantastic shapes. What are the limitations? Um, well, so is the, I suppose some of these are because, yeah, I mean, you can make something about this. Well, you thought that would be a bit silly. But, but anything. If you are, it is it's not a mass production. It is not a mass production method as such. Uh, they used to do it individually, but uh, in a lot of applications, they, they have these what they call trees. <coughs> Imagine a tree, um, branches of the tree having these uh, sort of wax bottles. <laughs> And have channels, channels for liquid for liquid metal to get into the wax models. Too. So you make a tree, you cover the whole tree with uh, that slurry ceramic, let it dry. Then once you pour the liquid into it, goes and fills all the thing. So you can do perhaps two dozen at a time, two dozen products at a time, but not a lot. It's, uh, as I said, it, it's, it's a very, very old process they used to make, and they still do, for individual jewelry, the more expensive ones. When you, can make, you can design your own jewelry, and if you're sort of artistic, you can make it, make anything. <laughs> um, having said that, they also make it, they all, so you, it's a very modern process as well, because now with the, the CAD, CAD facilities, you, have, you can produce the initial wax model using, once you have a solid model, then you send it to one of these rapid prototyping machines that produces your wax model very quickly. Okay. So it's very old and very new. It's one of those very interesting processes, investment cost. Because as I said, with the CAD model, with the sort of solid model, it can produce. Have you seen? Some of you might have seen it in the lab. Rapid prototyping. <laughs> yes. Do, do you all know what rapid prototyping is? Good. So, if you know what it is, you know that you can once you produce your CAD model, solid model, you can send it to the machine and it. Fits any type of casting, including any shape you want. And then you can use that shape to do more investment costing. 
Okay, any questions on method uh, forming? They're okay. You know it all. Good. Let's go to another question. Now, uh, okay. Talk about talk about processing of metal. What about processing of plastic? What are the main processes for plastic? Injection molding, the most common ones. Uh, no molding. Anything else? Okay. Let's. Uh, injection molding, dome molding, rotation molding, vacuum forming. Come on. Thank you. Explosion, yeah. Injection molding, extrusion, vacuum forming. Rotation molding. Anything else you said? Blow molding. Blow molding. Anything else? I think you said it. I mean, there, because there are various, there are various uh, derivatives of the but on the whole, it's all the name. Well, we haven't, we haven't completed the list. Any other method? Uh, yeah, what is this called? Yeah, uh, pressing it into the area. Yeah, I mean, you, you can press everything, but I mean, I'm talking about the, as a production, as a production method. Extrusion, what is, leave that till last. Extrusion, what is that? What is that? Forcing, I mean, not, not like metal extrusion. Softening a plastic, forcing it into a die. Vacuum forming. Some of you have done product design and some probably done vacuum forming. Yes. Very simple. A sheet of plastic, sheet of plastic, you heat it, you soften it. Then, right, and she's doing this. Yeah. <laughs> then you produce. A vacuum, sort of you suck the, this sheet into the shape you want your plastic to take. All these are about the same. Rotation molding forces the bit of plastic to one take the shape of the mold. Come on, what does tell what do these tell you about what the plastics, what type of plastics these have to be? <laughs> thermoplastic, thank you. And the more these are good for thermoplastic. <laughs> Injection molding, it used to be only for thermoplastic, but now they, they do use it for some of the, some forms of injection molding are used for thermosetting, for some thermosetting plastic. The, the process we missed here was is called compression molding. <laughs> I don't use it for thermoplastic, but it's then used for thermosetting plastic. Okay. Polymer powder is poured into a mold the shape of the what our product you want to make is compressed on the heat and polymerization <coughs> occurs and you get a solid. Uh, a compression molding and
A similar process, you should know, is called transfer molding. It's more or less the same thing. It's, it's, it's compression molding, except that it's done in two stages. In the first stage, the plastic is sort of half uh, heated, not fully heated, and not pressed. The second stage is heated and more heat applied. The fact that it's transferred from one stage into another uh, is the reason why they call it transfer molding. It's the same thing. Essentially, the mechanics are the same. Okay. Uh, what are the what are the issues with injection molding? What's the first thing you consider when you do injection molding? The mass production. Mass production. Ex ex exactly. Mass production. It's only really good for mass production. Why? Because it's because dyes are on the whole tools that they call them are expensive. They're not cheaper than they used to. I mean, except that they're not cheap. I mean, that, that man that I tell students, no, you come this, do this by Jake Morning and it costs you a lot. Then he comes back or she comes back, oh no, I've just had a call from China uh, that sent me a mold for only 5,000 hands. Uh, I don't know how they make him do it, but the prices of tools, dyes have come down. And not very safe. How reliable they are, I don't know. Um, I'm told by people actually in industry, but businessmen, that if you want good quality, you went from China, you have to pay for it. So it's only the cheap ones that are. Uh, sorry, not the low quality ones that are cheap. But anyway, so the, the most important consideration is that you said how many are making, how many are making. Okay, the machinery is both the die is expensive, the tool is expensive, and the machinery is expensive. Injection, injection molding machinery. Uh, extrusion. Extrusion. The dies are expensive, not as expensive as injection molding. The, Process is it's again is expensive in terms of machinery, not perhaps not quite always as that. These are a lot cheaper. These three are a lot cheaper in terms of more than the tools. But what is the in terms of features? How would you compare these? Where can you use these and where can't you use these? Somebody just says, where, where, what design considerations come into consideration? What do you, what things can't you use with these, which you can with these? Set any direction more. Dimensional angles. Yeah. Dimensional angles. Vacuum forming. Vacuum forming is lovely. It's quick. It's cheap. Very cheap. Very cheap. But you can you cannot get sort of precision dimensions. You cannot get exact dimension. You cannot get the close tolerances. If you're if you're making something, uh, I don't know, part of say gearbox, then the tolerances often have to be a tenth of a millimeter. One, say, no, one millimeter, no, one millimeter. We cannot achieve that with that no forming. All right. When you consider processes, any questions? Any questions on this? There is a question here, if you can answer it. We, we looked at methods, we looked at, we looked at methods, and we looked at Plastics. What about ceramics? What about ceramics? Well, what are the features of ceramics? 
There are what something all ceramics have in common, all ceramics have in common, is that they are hard. <laughs> right? They are hard. Why are they hard? It is because of the fundamental bonding. What type of bonding do they have? Absolutely. Ionic and occasionally covalent, mostly ionic. And ionic bond fundamentally it is hard. Ceramics also are brittle. Certainly traditional or things like china, glass, etc. things are brittle. They are brittle because they cannot be formed. Also, why are, why are traditional ceramics like china, porcelain, why are they so brittle? Why and why are they brittle? so easy. There are lots of things that are hard, but they don't they're not necessarily break off. Why? Why 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 do they have no problems? Something fundamental you should know. Because because of porous. They are porous. Porous means lots of pores. That's a whole thing now. Uh, in China, of course, you can see the naked eye. When you look at it, you go, you need to have you use a hand lens, you can see it's full of holes. Once it's fractured, once it's fractured, once that uh, uh, glass, several <coughs> glasses has gone, it's porous. That is the reason why ceramics, traditional ceramics, are free -tops. A new class of ceramics have been developed in recent years, which we call high performance ceramics. And you should, you should know that. High performance ceramics. There were things like silicon nitride, <laughs> alumina, zirconia. Alumina is aluminium oxide. Zirconia, zirconia is zirconium oxide. Silicon nitride is silicon and silicon and nitride combined. These modern, these modern, very modern, what we call high performance ceramics, have much better toughness than the old ceramics. They're still not as tough as, I don't know, good steel. They're still not as tough as metal, but they are tough. We can actually drop them. They won't break them. Not like China. You can actually uh, use put force on them. They won't break. The reason for that is new processes, new processes reduce the amount of porosity. They are all they are a lot more solid. They have a lot less pores in them. They are still, still not hundred percent solid, but. Whereas other ceramics are only about 60 percent solid, these are perhaps 90 per 80 percent, 90 percent solid. They are called high performance or modern ceramics. They are a lot, lot more expensive than certain old ceramics. They are even a lot, lot more expensive than metals as well. A lot more expensive than metals. So what should we use them? <coughs> Sorry. They are not corrosive, that's right, they don't corrode. Well, what, why else? Very high melting point, excellent. Very high. Ceramic, metal, even the sort of really, what can I say, a high nickel alloy, or, or steel with a lot of nickel, or a high nickel alloy, which you can use for high, at high temperature. You can't really use them at temperatures over about 600, 700 degrees. They stop. They don't melt, but they start burning soft. They lose. They lose their hardness. They lose their wear properties. They lose their strength. Ceramics, no problem. Silicon nitride, no problem. Alumina, no problem. But something else. They're insulated, absolutely. They are they, 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 are, they don't conduct heat or electricity, or very little heat. 
almost no electricity. Something else, something else, very important. There are lights. Okay, there are lights. So this. And the fact that they are hard, it's fantastic. In, in an engine, the problem with engines is that they were. In the old days, you uh, after about uh, certainly 100,000 miles, this is many years ago, 100,000 miles, you'd have to, you'd have to refurbish the engine, your car engine. Sit in, uh, the pistons would have to come out, rings had to be changed. Very often the cylinders have to be removed and all that because of wear, right? In modern materials, modern oil wear is reduced. If some, some, a lot of cars, the Japanese started it uh, some years ago, started using ceramic in some, some parts of the car. And the amount of wear has come down a lot. Okay, the main, the main, the main, the main limitation or drawback with ceramic, with these high performance ceramics, is the cost. We are talking about even uh, the, a few, several times the cost of even titanium. Okay? There's only use where uh, the cost can be justified. You need so you need a good appreciation of why ceramics are the way they are and what uses they have. You should be able to argue. Okay. Heat treatments. Heat treatment, let's start with heat treatment, general heat treatment. Some basic heat treatment. What is the process we use to, what oh. type of heat treatment do you use to make a metal, a metal to the best bit? Thank you, that is the word, anemic. That is the process of annealing, the process of annealing reduces the internal stresses and makes the material tougher, easier to shape and all that. Nearly always, if you want to do press work, cold forming or method, you first anneal them. You prepare them by annealing them. What is, what, essentially, what is the process of annealing? Quickly. In that's one sentence. Heating followed by very slow cooling. Generally, you after you heat it to whatever temperature you have to heat it to. But when it comes to cooling, you cool it in the furnace very gently. So that is the key word. Anyway, right. Now you should be able to answer this question. How do you harden steel? How do you harden it? What's the process? Absolutely. Heat it above the critical temperature, then quench it, cool it fast. You've, you've not seen it, right? What happens with steel? Come on, you have to describe it. Because you've done it. What happens with steel? When you heat it to a high temperature. That's a good liquid, you don't heat it enough to melt it. No, no way. If you melt it, it goes all over the place. No, it sticks on it. But you reach it to a temperature at which what happens? What should happen? It, this is the key word. This is the key word. With sticks, you heat it to a temperature at which austenite forms. The structure changes from ferro to austin. If that doesn't happen, then nothing happens. It has to. Be. If you are doing, if you are doing farming, once you get to austenite, once everything is austenite, then if you cool it back slowly, that is a needle, right? That's a needle. So your your component will be hot. 
But instead of ruling it slowly, if you dump it in a bucket of water, like we did in the lab, us then I will, will want to go back to where it was. I can't, you're not letting it. You don't, you're not letting it happen to move. You end up with a structure called mark and signs. And it's that mark and sign that is hard. Okay? No excuse for not doing that, you've seen it. So you heat it to a critical temperature at which austenite forms, then you quench it and austenite changes to mark and sign. Look, it is annealing is the same. The difference between annealing and hardening is that in and in both cases to heat it to the austenite temperature. But with the kneading, you cool it in the furnace, so the austenite gently moves back to ferrite. The same structure. With hardening, because you're quenching it, it changes into martensite. The word is martensite, which is hard. Yes? Each treatment you should know. If you, what if you just want to harden parts of a component? Perhaps you don't want to harden everything, the whole part. Huh? What do I do? Very often, with steel, with steel, you just want a hard surface. That is called surface treatment. It's called case hardening. Case hardening, i.e. surface. So really, the answer is you just eat the surface. And do that change only to the surface. It's a very common process. You do it either by polarizing night or night riding. Any questions on these things? So there's a question. Shape. What's this funny shape diagram? Huh? Thank you. Phase diagram. Phase diagrams are maps, if you like, to tell you the maps guiding you what the phases are, what the structures are at various temperatures of an alloy. Of an alloy. An alloy, i.e., mixture of various methods. And this is for what we call a binary alloy. Binary means two, two elements. So we have two elements of, say, metal A and metal B. And this part, and please remember, remember how to read this. At this corner, at this end, we have a hundred percent A 0% B, pure A. At this end, we have 100% B, 0% A. Anywhere in between, you have a bit of each. Right in the middle, you have 50% A, 50% B. Right? Please, 
There are notes on, on my video, but remember, it, it's very easy. If you have pure A, if you have pure metal A, then you are here. That means it will melt at this temperature. This is this y axis is temperature. It means if you have pure metal A, it melts at that temperature. If you have pure metal B, it melts at this, at this temperature. <laughs> Tm of B. If you have a bit of A and a bit of B, then it varies. Above these two lines, you have just liquid. Only, only. Below this line, below here, you have all solid. Right, everything is solid. What have we got here? I use this mixture of, I call it a mushy zone. Mixture of solid and liquid. You can And here the same. Here you have all solid, here you have all solid, and here you have all solid. Here between these two, remember, remember, a zone, a zone that is made between two different zones is made up of two zones. Okay. This is called a, an equilibrium phase diagram. This uh, let's I'll just, i put some numbers here, 200 degrees, 400 degrees, 600 degrees, 700 degrees, and suppose this is 800, no, sorry, 800 degrees, and suppose this is 1,000 degrees, okay? Right. This, this temperature, where, where this line is. This point in particular, above which is all liquid, below which is all solid. This, which according to what I put here, is about 550, 560 degrees, if you believe these numbers are put here. This temperature is known as the eutectic temperature, and this point is known as eutectic. <laughs> Point. You think it is is has got an agree to the word. It's easy melting. What 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 does it mean? It means for this alloy system is the percentage, the particular percentage that gives you the lowest melting point. As I said, above if, if you have a composition, if you have this composition, if you have if you have an alloy with this composition, it melts at this temperature. It, of all these mixtures, this is the mixture that gives you the lowest melting point. The lowest melting point. This is what you take. Uh, if, if you were to guess, if, if you were to guess if this is 100% A and this is 100% B, what would this point be? How, what percentage would it have of A and what percentage of B? Roughly, looking at that. Oh, no, this is So I'm saying you said it. 
about 80 percent A. Yeah, I, I, I think that is good enough. 80 percent A plus 20 percent B. Yeah, okay. Yeah, roughly. Okay, might be 75, 35. But that's not that. Okay. Now this means it is it is the alloy. It is the alloy that has the lowest melting. Now this has certain uses. If you want to cost something, if you want to cost something, what do you have to do? You have to make it, yeah? The alloy you choose, if you want to use the least amount of energy, the alloy you use will be an alloy with this composition. For example, most sand costing aluminium, sand cost aluminium alloys, are made from alloy called LM6, that's the number for it. It is aluminium with 13% silica. That is the eutectic composition for aluminium aluminium. That's the one you're going to choose because you want to use the least amount of energy. You don't want to heat it unnecessarily. So if you can, you use that one. The cheapest possible. A solder. You've all seen soldering, yeah? Soldering iron. Soldering iron, it, it used to be thin and dead. It's not now because then because then it's poisonous and so on, so they have different uh, alloys. But that always they use the you take the composition to give you the easiest one to make. Right? So you know the meaning of your technique. You know whether you take it. Right? Now, can you tell me now? Can you tell me now? I said, I said, here you have a solid. But it's not pure A. You have a solid, it's not pure A. It is a solid with some A and a little bit of B. It's, it's a solid that is very rich in A. In the normally, this is called a phase or a region. And this thing is called a phase. That's why this is called a phase. Right? Phase as in P-H-A-S-E. Normally, for these phases are okay. given great characters. For example, alpha. And this one, beta. Okay. Here, obviously, here, here is all alpha, here is all beta. Here you have alpha plus beta. If you look at it, if you look at if you cut a piece of material from this region, look at it under the microscope, it has some alpha grains, some beta grains. Okay. What if I pick an alloy with If I pick an alloy here, it's 60%, 60%, sorry, 40% A, 60% B. If what, if I look at it under the microscope, how much of it will be alpha, how much of it will be beta? Now pick an alloy here. Look, pick an alloy here. How much of it will be of this time? How much of it will be of that time? We use what do we use? Something called Lieber's rule. Lieber. <laughs> yeah, like a seesaw, and it works like a seesaw. And it, remember this seesaw business because that's useful. Okay, the amount of, <coughs> at here, the amount of alpha, the amount of this, is equal to 
this bit divided by the total bit. So, so you have to read it. Uh, I'm going to call this, uh, if I call this point, I don't know, I'm going to call this point uh, X, point this Q, point, call this, um, what shall I call this? Uh, huh? Why? Okay. <laughs> well, no, but it's, I don't want to. So call it something else. Q T. <laughs> okay. Now, yeah, if you want to, how, if you know, want to know how much here, yeah, how much beta you have, how much alpha you have, use the reversion. The amount of, for example, the amount of alpha at here, the amount of alpha percentage alpha percentage alpha. Is look this bit that is why I said the man, think of CSO. This bit, not that bit, this bit, the opposite bit, i.e. XT, the length of XT divided by the total length. Right? Percentage. Beta is the other way around. Is this bit which is, come on, you tell me. Uh, what divided by what? Remember, remember, the first CSO, Q, thank you, QX divided by QT. The bottom, the denominator is the same. <laughs> Yes, you remember that? It is all in your notes in details. You need to be able to do that. Are you okay with that? Read your notes. Read your notes. One last. Ah, no. Not quite now. Composites. 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 I'm telling you what's in the exam, what won't you? Everything. <laughs> yeah, um, so it's the sort of, really the sort of thing you need to do. Yeah. May well be, yes. <laughs> composites. How many types of composites have we got? How many types of composites have we got? <laughs> What, 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 is, what is a composite? What is a composite? A material that is made from what? Two different families of metals. So if you have two metals, it's not a composite. If you have two plastics, you don't have a composite. But if you have a metal and a plastic, you have a composite. If you have a metal and a ceramic, you have a composite. If you have a plastic and a ceramic, you have a composite. In reality, in practice, the common composites, you know, the, the common common ones, are made from generally plastics and ceramics. <laughs> Namely, the bulk is a plastic like polyester, or epoxy resin, and the ceramic is glass fiber. This is the cheapest, the most common type of composite. We call it GRP, glass reinforced plastic. Remember, composites are on the whole are made up of at least two different elements. And generally they are made up of two elements. Each element has got a role. They are made up of what we call the matrix, which is the bond. Then we have generally reinforces. The ones that make it strong. Right? One example is what they use in buildings, reinforced concrete. Reinforced concrete is what? Is concrete reinforced, which is the bulk concrete is the bulk, reinforced with steel bars. Steel bars is the reinforcement. GRP, they also reinforced plastic, has got, generally speaking, 
epoxy resin, which is a plastic, which is the bulk, and we call it the matrix. Remember the matrix and reinforcement, which is which are glass fibers, right? So modern expensive composites are the same, except that instead of glass fiber, now you have carbon fiber, but essentially the same. Essentially the same. You have the bulk, you have the matrix, and you have the fiber. Fiber are the reinforcers. So the is strengthens. Comp composites are generally speaking, are generally speaking, are of three types. There are three types of composites. So depending on the form that the reinforcement is in. If the reinforcement, the one that gives it the strength, this is, if it's in powder form, we call it powder reinforced composite. Powder reinforced. Powder reinforced composite, really, the only example that is common is aluminium with alumina. Alumina, aluminium oxide. Is that. Then you have what they call particulate reinforced composites. That is, so, can you leave the discussion till afterwards? Then you have particulate reinforced compass. That is where the reinforcement, the strength, and the, is in is in chunky forms. Generally speaking, generally speaking, example for that, no examples of that is sort of stage with long sum tungsten. Cobalt with long sum long sub tungsten carbide in it, tools and things are made from that. Not very common, not not bulk. By far the most the most common one are where you have fibers. Fibers as the reinforcement. Fibers are either continuous fibers, long, long length of fiber, or chopped fibers. Right? Whether it's glass, whether it's glass or carbon, we can either have continuous fibers or charged fibers. Continuous fibers are much stronger, but a lot more expensive, but less versatile. Charged fibers are much easier to produce. We can actually inject and mold it, provided the fibers are short enough. <laughs> Continuous fiber, the advantage. Yeah. Continuous fibers are by far the strongest, but the disadvantage is the properties are very directional. They are very strong in the direction of the fibers, not so strong in the direction at 90 degrees of the fibers. There is equation that you need to be able to use and you need to write by heart by heart you know you, it's not something that you get but it's a very simple one it's called the rule of mixture for composites if you have if you have the stiffness of the elements of a composite you can find the stiffness of the composite instead of using this formula it's a very simple formula very simple formula the Young's modulus of the composite. If I call composite C, the Young's modulus of composite is equal to equal to the volume volume fraction volume fraction of the fibers. For example, if you have sixty percent fiber, volume fraction is 0.6. Remember. If you have 50% fiber, VF is 0.5. VF multiplied by the young modulus of fiber plus VM, volume fraction of the rest of it, matrix, matrix, M for matrix, times the young modulus of the matrix. Remember this formula. Young modulus of the composite as a whole. C, C for something. Volume fraction of the fiber. That is, is fract 
It's not percentage fraction. So 50% is 0.5, yes? 20% means 0.2, yes? And this is a Young's modulus of the fiber. This is the volume fraction of the matrix, of the plastic, of the binder. So if this, if this is 20%, this is 80%. In other words, if this is 0.2, this is 0.8, yes? If this is 0.4, this is 0.6. If this is 0.7, this is 0.3. And this is the young continuous of the class, of the matrix. And exa a quick example for GRP, for a very common GRP, a very common GRP, Young's modulus of the matrix of the matrix is perhaps about uh, three kilopascal. Come on, can you can you work out the young modulus of this plastic if you have, if I have six if I have sixty percent gloss, forty percent uh, plastic, sixty percent gloss, forty percent plastic. So what is it? What is the what's the young modulus of the company? Come on, what, what is I'm using this formula. What is BF? What is BF here? <laughs> no point. What am I saying? Which is the fiber? Is gloss is the fiber? Thank you. No point six. No point six multiplied by what? Multiplied by what? There, somebody said it. Seventy. Yes. Are we all? Do we agree with seventy? What what is what is volume fraction of matrix? What is the M? Point four. And what is EM? Three. Well done, thank you. So this is going to be not six plus forty two plus one point two. So, the Young's modulus of the composite as a whole is 43.2 kilopascal. Yeah? You learn that? In the opposite direction, it's different. <laughs> But in reality, if, for example, the uh, helicopter plates, modern helicopter plates are all common, but they want them to be strong in all, in all directions, not just an object fiber. So what do they do? They have the, the, they layer it. They layer it. So you have a layer with fibers going in this direction, another layer going in this direction, another layer has a 45 direction, another has a 135 degree direction, and so on. You can get strength in all directions. Any questions? Any questions? You've had enough. Okay. Uh, sorry, just uh, somebody was the last week or the week before. You're talking about different examples. There are no different examples. So all the, the exam is only one day by the second of June. Okay. No.
Okay, good luck with the exam. If you if you have any questions, ask me by email or come and see me. Yes, only the calculator. I'm sorry, Jeff. He said they asked me if you could bring programmer or calculator. I said you can bring anything to the computer. Oh. Grace, yeah. let me know when you're revising. Revising. I'll revise.